lot of people often use uh, sources from YouTube. Um, but maybe sometimes they might not be aware of or know of other resources that they can access um, in order to show video in the class. Um, I'll let Genevieve kind of speak to it a little bit, but sometimes there's some challenges with using only video resources from YouTube. But I am really happy to see that our Mentimeter has some submissions from lynda.com and the school library. So it sounds like a couple of people already feel comfortable in the library space. Genevieve, can you speak a little bit to YouTube? Yeah. So YouTube is fine and great to use, um, but we try to leave that as the last resort option um, uh, just because when we're teaching students how to do research in all the COM1085 courses, we're always starting with the library databases first. Um, they are a paid subscription that the library handles. We know that they're from academic sources. We know that they're current and relevant um, to today's subjects, and they are cross-referenced, peer-reviewed, etc. Um, so as YouTube is just the last resort, you can still find tons of great options on YouTube, um, but we do try to teach students and faculty on how to determine if these sources on YouTube are legitimate, are they copyright free, um, things like that. So I want to take a minute and just kind of I think I have lost your video. Sorry, I'm interrupting you there. No, not the video, the audio, sorry. Yep. I can't hear you either, Jesslyn. I think you hit your mute button because there's a line through your microphone. Oh, yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> so is yeah. there anyone, um, would you like to share what you would like to be able to take away from today's workshop? Um, you know, would you like to be able to research more effectively using YouTube or would you like to experience the, the video resources that are available through the library in more depth? Um, we could do any one of those. Just set some goals or some targets for us to hit by the end of today's workshop. Okay. So um, um, maybe I'll start first. So anything that we can use other than YouTube, because that's like 80% of what I use. And uh, at times when I go online, uh, the biggest roadblock I hit is most of the good stuff is it's paid. So I just go back to YouTube then. I have tried to use the library resources, but I'm not very fluent with it. I'll, I'll be honest. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Fantastic. Yeah, and that's that's definitely was one of the goals that we had kind of set out for this workshop. Um, so we'll hope we're hoping that we can tick those boxes for you today, Adija. Leanne, do you have different goals in mind? Um, I have used some YouTube and think I'm using it properly, hopefully. Um, and I've used some libraries, so just basically becoming more fluent and making sure I am doing things properly. Nice. Yeah, we can strike that for you and hopefully I find a balance. Linda.com, so maybe even becoming more familiar with Linda. I've never used Linda before. Oh, cool. Yeah, there we go. Linda, you're going to think it's fantastic, but it's one of a variety of fantastic um, databases that the library offers, so we can kind of cover the gamut. And then uh, Anna had offered uh, in the preview session or the pre-area um, that she's looking for ways for making teaching more interactive engage and engaging. So Anna, this workshop is going to give you a good foundation in what video is out there. Um, and if you'd like it, there is a follow up workshop virtual as well. This happening tonight called video lessons to get students engaged in talking. So I'm running that between 530 and 730 tonight here in teams again. And the intention of that workshop is to show you some free apps that you could use in addition to your videos. Um, to kind of spur students to talk, converse, to share ideas, and some best practices for running those videos in class. Uh, it's going to be interesting for me to do that as a virtual workshop. It looks a lot different when I run it in person and face to face, um, but it is really challenging for people to make it. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. I feel like you come to all my workshops. 
Um, I do I do think that it is really tough to make it into campus sometimes, so I wanted to make all of my workshops available uh, both online or in person. So I hope that that's the reason why some of you signed up for these workshops. Um, and hopefully Genevieve and I can can take you away into some of the resources that we know are out there. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Genevieve and I'm going to invite her to share her screen. Mm -hmm. um, do you need a minute to get set up Genevieve? Mm -hmm. Good. OK, so uh, Genevieve is going to take you through the library database. So if you're not already there, you might want to start by opening up the library's website. OK, everyone. Give me a second. Yep. Okay, so you should be seeing um, our Conestoga's homepage, conestogac.on.ca. Um, so I'm just going to navigate over to the library. We're found under Campus Life and Services under the heading Academics and Learning. The last stop there is the library. Perfect. So here's our main homepage. And now the fastest way to the video resources I find is to um, to the right of the search box right here, find more resource and you can click by type. Just click on that. So here's a listing. Um, it's kind of a wayfinder on how to get you to where you want to go from in the library's website. So right here we'll see videos. And this will lead you to the videos web page um, that I've put together. So there's some great stuff here. There's some information about sharing and posting videos, um, citation, how to cite videos in the class, our popular films collection, tips for open access videos. Uh, if you would like to, me to purchase a video, there's the option there too, request a video. Um, booking DVDs for class and accessible media. Um, so we'll touch on the basics of each of those factors there. I'm going to bring it back now to the collections portion, which you're seeing just on the main page. So all of these databases that you're seeing are paid for by the library. These are all academic sources. They're all closed captioned. Most importantly, um, the college standard is if you're showing it for educational purposes, it must be closed captioned. It must be turned on. Um, if you ever have a student in your class that has an accommodation that requires closed captioning, who requires closed captioning, um, you have to make sure to post those links at least two weeks in advance. That way they have time to preview it and um, or just let me know if anything you're using is not closed captioned. Um, just get in touch with me and we'll work our way through the process together. Um, so, so yeah, so we've got some great, great topics or great databases here. You'll see a blurb on each topic on, on each database to see what they cover. Um, just for demonstration's sake, let's head into Films on Demand. So, this database, um, I like it because it covers a lot of different um, aspects, different subjects. It, what you'll find, what's common among these databases is that it feels very Netflix-like. Um, so the ease of it, you're not left wondering, where do I click, where do I go, how do I know what this is? Um, it's all very simple. So in the top left-hand menu there, you'll see a little menu icon. Um, you'll see the search box here. And then if you scroll down, these are just some of the films that the platform highlights. So let's say let's with this together, and I'm going to ask you guys to hover your mouse over the menu, um, the menu icon there in the left hand corner. You can browse videos. And this is just to demonstrate the vast majority of subjects that they cover. So as you can see, the list is fairly long and it does get quite intricate in the subtopics that it covers. So let's just choose an example to dive into. Let's do uh, business education. So I'm just going to click on that. Okay. And then from there, so you'll see a listing of some recommended videos that cover business education. 
in the right hand menu, you'll see another subject guide there. So it will take you further um, and then divvy out more of those subtopics, which I find is really great. Um, so let's head into business communication now, see what they have listed. And these are one of the most common topics that can transcend throughout all the schools at the college as communication is a vital part of um, what each program does. Um, so what I also like about this one is if you keep scrolling down, still looking in the same right hand menu, you'll see the copyright date. So we always want, I always recommend the last five years um, for any academic resources, whether it be um, an academic journal or a video, just so that we're staying recent with the times. So you'll see there another listing of uh, video resources. I'm just going to click on one as an example to show you guys what it will look like. So it, it feels the same as YouTube, but it's a much better source. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so you've got your basic play button there on the screen. Let's see. And then what I'm going to do is there's the closed captioning menu. Um, you'll always want to set it. There we go. There it is. Oh, where'd it go? There it is. So pause, volume. When you're in the classroom, make sure that you have that full screen on, especially in the bigger rooms there. I'm just going to yeah, pause that. So a couple of key features that you may want to note, um, if you'd like to share this video with your students or post it in um, Econestoga or in your PowerPoint, there is a link button just right below the title. There's a link button there. Scroll down some more. Which that like almost threw me the first time that I, I looked at that because my instinct was to go over to the share or to grab the link in um, in the address bar, like in the browser address bar. Why wouldn't it work if I grab the browser address bar one? Right, so if you were to grab the browser link right at the top, it would lead you to an institutional login screen and asking you to log in and pay for it. Um, so what this permalink does, per, it stands for permanent link, is that it overrides, it has a proxy embedded there, so that it overrides that institutional login. It acknowledges that yes, you are affiliated with the college and they have paid for this uh, subscription. Um, so it will take you straight to the video, no problem. Is there anything that um, I need to keep in mind, like if people were working at home and accessing the video library resources, is there anything that I need to keep in mind? Mm -hmm. Yes, so similar to when you are searching or sharing um, academic journals, once you click on that link, it will bring you to the library's login screen. It's going to ask for your ID number, so that will be the employee or the student number followed by the PIN as your password. And that PIN is the yes. last four digits of your employee or student number. And again, when you get to that login screen, that information is listed there. But when, when you're, you're like, if you put that into, into your course shell or into your PowerPoint, when you're here on campus, it won't ask you for a login, right? No, that's right. Since you're already connected to the network, it will just take you straight there. Awesome, thank you. No problem. I get nervous, how's it gonna work? <laughs> I know it's, that's always the question. How does it look on the flip side? Um, so I'm going to also point out um, one neat trick here. So say you wish to only show chapter two of this video. You have the option to click straight to chapter two. And when you scroll down, to that link, it's showing us two links. Um, so the record URL is going to refer to the link to the whole video. I believe this is nine minutes and 43 seconds. So that link is going to link to the entire video um, versus the segment URL, this guy right here, it's going to link to just that chapter two. So that is one way um, you can shorten those those viewing times in the classroom. It does allow you to trim it even further if you wish. Um, in the top right hand corner of this screen, there is a um, 
create an account option and you do have a chance to create a free account. It's uh, free charge, don't pay for it. But that, what that allows you to do is to create your favorite lists and create these custom segments. Um, so yeah, so say you only, only wanted 10 seconds of a video, you have that option to record that 10 seconds, save it to the playlist, and then same thing, it will create a shorter um, permanent link for you to share or post with your students. Yeah. Cool, I didn't know that. So, um, if you scroll down, there's some more recommended videos there that will populate based on what you're viewing. And then lastly, what I like to uh, majorities, majority of these databases will offer you a citation. Yeah, option. I love the citation. So what I like about this is that I don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I can pull up APA at Conestoga, if that's what you're using in classes, I can pull that up on my screen and then I can paste uh, this entire URL into my document and I can just nip and tuck in order to adapt it to APA at Conestoga. Yeah, there's something really beautiful about that. Yeah. Oh, Jess, I think your mic's off. Can you hear me now? No. Nothing at all. I can hear you, Jess. Oh, yeah, yeah. Me too. Genevieve, is your volume up? Here. Here. I can't hear you. Hang on. Just a second. <gasps> okay. There we go. Every month, at some point in time in their career, Sorry, yeah. it's attacked by the angry alligator. So, I so still remember like how somebody's running out of money. In a conflict resolution I session, that might be me. <laughs> like a nice convenient way to kind of shop for or search for videos and there's something I really love about having that APA citation auto generated um, are we ringing any bells or, or checking off any boxes for anyone so far does this seem usable in your classroom context yeah for sure it definitely seems usable yeah you're like writing like a fiend over there Leanne so it seems like it's working for you so far yep Aditya, how about you? Yeah, that, that's a good resource. I actually had a question or two, if I, if I can go ahead. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have two options when we go to YouTube. That's one is the embed option. Another one is to copy the URL. So which one uh, is this exactly? Are we embedding the video or we are just uh, going to use it as a URL? Genevieve, do you mind if I take this one? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so Aditya, um, you can do some, are you talking about within your course shell or in PowerPoint? Uh, both actually, because what I do is I create a hyperlink in my PowerPoint presentations and then I, I, I post the very same as a separate video also in the course shell. So there are like two options. Okay, so you can get really fancy with how you bring in YouTube video into your um, into your teaching. And uh, just because it's possible doesn't mean that it creates the most beautiful experience for everyone. So I'm going to show you. I put a link in um, in the chat window, but if you want to just open up your browser, it's bit.ly slash ppt dash resources. Um, and I'm just going to pull it open in an incognito browser window so you can see, so we can see exactly what you would be looking at. Um, I actually don't advocate for that embed option. So let me pull it open and I'm going to share with you all. Um, sorry, I just have to close the share tray and reopen it. Okay, here we go. So that link that I shared with you should take you to something that like that's uh, looks like this, where um, this is really just a, a a OneDrive folder that I built to share PowerPoint 
samples with all of the faculty here at Conestoga. And if you look at one of them, uh, it's called Template Video Slides, PPTEX. Um, the simplest way to add content into your PowerPoint slide decks is instead of embedding it, um, which can make your PowerPoints really big and cumbersome, you know, our students interact with these, they download them, we don't want to give them content that's huge, um, and we don't want to put a lot of work into to building these presentations. Instead, what I advocate for, or I recommend, as soon as the page loads, it just needs a, per, a second, um, is just linking to the videos in a more sophisticated fashion. So what we often do is um, maybe we just do a hyperlink like this one, APA at Conestoga. Um, something that might be worse is if we just paste the URL, right? HTTPS colon two backslashes. Uh, we can't just paste URLs like that into PowerPoint slides or into any content. Honestly, in my viewpoint, we shouldn't paste that uh, links like that to anyone because it's yucky to read, but yeah. even more so for students using screen readers, um, that is uh, an, a completely unpleasant listening experience for them to have their screen reader read out loud HTTPS colon two backslashes stu conestoga c o n dash my shit. You know, we just don't want people to have to read it. Um, many people just use the, the linked text like this, but I might even suggest that if you're up for it, um, instead, link to students using um, an image file. So what I've provided in this PowerPoint slide deck, and I know it says read only, you don't have permission to edit this file, but you can file and download it for yourself. Download as, take your own copy, use it how you will. Um, this is a fully accessible slide template that you can copy and paste into any of your PowerPoint slide decks. And this black and white one is the one that I would suggest using if you're going to use it with open videos or databases videos from the library. You can see it has an image. This image, if you right click on it, you can actually hyperlink it in PowerPoint. Um, and it's just a it's, bit of a more beautiful experience. Sorry, was somebody going to offer a, a comment? And then uh, below that is an example of an appropriate APA citation of this video. So in particular, when you download this one, if you clicked this large icon, it would take you to a video um, about life in Canada from Films on Demand. And the convention for APA citation for videos on a slide would be the producer, the year, and then the total timestamp of that entire video. So this slide is both intended to be something, you know, you could copy and paste over into your own slide decks and just substitute out your own links, your own title and your own citation format. If you were bringing in a YouTube video instead, I would suggest you do the same thing. But with this uh, YouTube slide, um, this is the most beautiful way for you to bring video into your slide deck experience. If you want to do that more conventional, um, just linking text format, go for that as well. Um, there's certainly nothing inaccessible or harmful about that, but I don't advocate or recommend embedding, especially because that embedding is only a skill set that works with YouTube video. Yeah. Does, does that help answer any questions? Yeah, of course. Of yeah. Course. Um, now it does look different uh, when you log into, um, E Conestoga. So when I go into my E Conestoga, let me just pull it open. It's going to ask me for my sign in. Nobody tell anyone how many letters my password is when I get there. When I sign into E Conestoga, then um, in my courses, I would probably link to it in a in a nicer fashion as well. I would not embed that content in E Conestoga either. Let me pull open, I have a video one right here. Here's how I would present that video in my Econestoga. So it's, you can see it's just a link over to that video. I use the permalink that Genevieve demonstrated from that uh, video resource database. Um, and below it, I tucked in a citation. So I would recommend wherever possible, 
Uh, using and demonstrating good citation habits. We know that citing is really challenging. We know that Conestoga has APA at Conestoga, which is our own version of APA. Um, and so wherever possible, if we can model and mentor good citation habits for our students, that will help them be successful um, in their own academic integrity. So what I did was copy and paste in the citation that came from Films on Demand. And then again, instead of including that hyperlink, that, um, that yucky hyperlink text, instead I hyperlinked the, the title of the video. So what this looks like is just uploading or create and create a link to add in the link from the database. Is that helpful, Aditya? Yeah. I think uh, mostly what I use is the other one. Uh, that's the video or, or something else which was written. I, I think the first or second option. That's what I have been using. Mm -hmm. But I'll use this in future. This is more convenient. Yeah, wherever possible, if we can just streamline um, the experience for our students, that will be the most beautiful experience that we can give them. And uh, embedding, honestly, uh, it only works for YouTube videos. So I would hate to show and demonstrate a skill set uh, that really only works in one context. Instead, you know, there's some PowerPoint resources you can pull into your own slide decks and um, right click to hyperlink the image. Then too, when you're in one of our classrooms with the interactive touch boards, you can just tap that large image and it pulls it open. Or you can click it with your mouse and it's almost easier to get to and hit and a little bit more efficient than a small hyperlink. Anna has a question in the chat and she's saying we can also add a brief description of video and time. Yeah, Anna, that's a fantastic su uh, suggestion. You know, um, maybe you want to clarify some guiding questions that you would like your students to consider um, when they're looking at the video, right? Uh, it's not sufficient that students are just asked to watch video. Uh, it would be fantastic to also encourage them to watch it um, consciously, to actively watch these videos. And so we could do that by either including in here a Word document for some questions or by including below it, guiding questions. Um, and that is not paragraph, that is a heading to, there we go. And include in maybe three questions that they could, um, they could consider or respond to in a discussion post or that you'll ask them in class uh, after they watch the video or while they've watched the video. Yeah. So that might be another way to do it as well. It doesn't have to look like text that you've added into this uh, object in the in Econestoga though. It can look like a link to a Word document in your OneDrive that has those questions or an uploaded, uh, an uploaded Word document that has those questions in it. Um, so it could look like a variety of things, but uh, adding in guiding questions and um, telling students how long the video is too makes a big difference. I would um, kind of express some caution, and I'm sure Jadavi might talk on this too. Um, shorter videos are always better. Uh, if I ask <laughs> workshop or students, workshop participants or students to watch a, a 13 or 15 minute video, they're far less li likely to successfully complete watching that video than if I ask them to watch something, say that's in the three to five minute mark. Uh, sometimes our topics are robust and our content um, just can't be covered in three to five minutes. Uh, the longest video segment that I would advocate for would be about six to nine minutes. And even around that nine minute mark, you're going to get some some trailers, some people who, who don't quite finish the video. Is that, does that sound like something manageable? Yeah. Yeah. Are you already using shorter videos in your teaching? I think so, yeah. The only one that's longer, but that's because I think I'm showing a women's video and I think that's a 20 minute, but that's because that's what it is and it has to be that long. Yeah. So what are some strategies that you're already using to help um, students kind of get through that whole video? Do you pause it in the middle to ask questions or what do you do when you show it in class to keep them attending? I can't say I'm doing anything special. I'm just mm -hmm. showing it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you could even consider assigning it uh, previous to class for homework. It is tough to think about ways that uh, we can get th students through an entire 20 minute video. Um, I had one faculty member that I was working with and he had such a fantastic suggestion. Uh, he, uh, it may not work in your context though. Um, he, would sh he was showing a video that um, was a bit older, but still relevant. And what he had students do to actively watch the videos was to shout out whenever they saw a health and safety issue <laughs> or problem. <laughs> um, and he would reward that, you know, the students who had picked up on something. So that's that's one thing that you could consider is can I can how can I engage my students to actively participate while we watch this video? You know, women's health and safety videos, they're only so engaging. Yes. Um, but if you can think of a way for students to do a total physical response, a TPR, which is what he was asking them to do, to stand up and shout if they saw something or maybe not shout, talk loudly. Um, or if you can ask students to back channel. So back channel is asking questions in a confined environment without necessarily presenting it immediately on the screen or without having them have to interrupt what the video as you're watching it. So earlier you saw me demonstrate uh, a Mentimeter. Let me just flip over to my Mentimeter um, and let me pull up a new one. I'm going to go into it. Are you all using like something like Mentimeter or a polling app in your teaching? I only oh. learned about them last semester and I really didn't know how to use them. So no, I have not used them yet. Yeah, Me neither. I just use discussions. That's all I use. Yeah, um, honestly, these polling apps, Mentimeter is one of a dozen. Uh, I have a workshop called Polling Apps in the Classroom, but these are my favorite. Uh, tool to use in um, teaching and workshops. They're so versatile. They let you ask questions of a big crowd without having uh, people raise their hands. They give you qualitative and quantitative data. Um, they're a great tool to have in your teaching toolkit. Mentimeter happens to be my favorite one. However, a lot of faculty here at Conestoga really like Socrative. Pull everywhere or Kahoot if you're thinking about running a game or a quiz. Yeah, and I've done one, one of the, Yeah, you've tried a Kahoot? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Sure. That, that's what I use. Yeah, yeah, and Kahoot, you know, um, our students are really comfortable with it. They've seen a lot of examples of it. They played it a lot, um, but Kahoot is fantastic for gamifying, right? It feels like a game. It looks like a game. It works like a game. Uh, if you're just looking for questions and answers, Kahoot feels too gamified to get serious responses sometimes, in my opinion. If you have, if you figured out a way to get it to give you serious responses and it works for you, then go ahead and use it. Um, Mentimeter I like because sometimes it feels a bit more serious. Um, and so what I set up is one slide in Mentimeter that I call my back channel. And all it is, is people have the ability to text in a question. You can see the type of question is an open-ended question. And I've run this recently. So I still have some examples in here of uh, the questions people were asking as I was running a video in workshop. So is this video fully accessible? Where does Khan Academy or a MOOC fit in? So it's even some thoughts on what is a back channel and, and does it reflect feedback? Having a back channel lets people actively think about what they're what they're working on. It lets them ask questions but not interrupt. Uh, maybe the flow or the delivery of information and it lets you pick and choose the questions that are most pertinent to get to. Um, I might not have touched on uh, something about video games in this particular workshop but that person still got to ask their question um, but I probably would touch on the two components that I did want to really answer in this particular workshop and I would always invite that people could come to me if with any unanswered questions. So that's one uh, kind of food for thought. It's not we don't usually get to this in this workshop, but um, I hope maybe that kind of helps you have a tool in your toolkit. Yeah. 
So Genevieve kind of took us through um, just what's available on the library's um, search by type. Let me see if I can pull it open. Browse streaming video resources. The library search by type page. Um, and honestly, when I was just kind of starting out by teaching, this is this is what I was looking for, you know, just to be able to go to um, one place and kind of look around for the kind of thing that I was looking for. So I'm looking for, I know I want to run a video in two weeks. I don't really know where to get those videos from. This is honestly all of the collections that the library has. Um, and Genevieve, we were running a workshop last week and we were working with one of the business faculty, right? And that faculty really liked Canopy. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? Genevieve? Yes, that's oh. right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, am I crazy? Where'd she go? <laughs> yeah, so um, that particular faculty member was looking for business case studies. And um, when she went into Canopy, uh, we discovered under the subject of business, there were um, tons and tons of videos there on business case studies. So it just takes a bit of poking around, um, a bit of exploring into each database. Um, and if you are more comfortable just shopping around that way, um, I would recommend going database by database. Um, but if there's something specific that you're looking for, um, what would be best in your case would be to use the library's um, main search engine. Do you want to share your yeah, screen? I'm just going to take over here, Jess. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then if you don't mind too, uh, if you have an opportunity talking about uh, lynda.com and the value that can bring too. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm just going to head back to my first tab here. Can everybody see that we're back on that video screen? Yep. 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 Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to click over to the library services logo to take us back to the library's homepage. And so in that um, search box, what this search box connects you to is all the databases that the library has access to. They are all indexed in this one stop search, um, which is really nice. So this will pull up anything on the databases. It will pull up our physical location in the stacks at all our library campus locations. Um, so it really is like a one stop shop. Um, so um, something again, let's stick with communications. Um, that's another that's one of the main topics that everybody's looking for in all of the programs on campus. So let's type in communication. Oops. communication. So this will show you tons of hits and you might be looking at this being like, what is all this stuff? I don't want a book. I don't want an ebook. I want a video. <laughs> and I also want to narrow down my search a bit. Sorry guys, I think my exit. What is going on with my search screen? There we go. Okay. in your search. So communications, you'll see another two additional lines there with the option to glue more search terms to that first term. So communication and let's see, I want, uh, let's do multicultural. Multicultural, I get this a lot with the nursing faculty. Um, so let's hit search again and see. So I want to know how to communicate better. Um, with the with different multicultural communities, um, patrons, like patrons, um, patients, uh, business partners, anything like that. So you can see here by the results, we're getting more narrower and narrower, but it's still showing us books and ebooks. So in the right hand menu there, you're going to see a limit to heading. Going to tell the search engine that you just want videos. Make sure to click videos. So now it's weeded everything else out and 
is just showing you videos as resources. So, so far less there. of like that Netflix feel in here. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. You got it. Much more of like a researcher field, feel, mm -hmm. look and feel. And again, this is the way that our library liaisons are teaching your students um, to do their research for their papers. So it's best to lead by example, in my opinion. Um, so one more thing I'm going to manipulate. You'll see again in the right hand menu, there's a publication date. So let's get rid of that old 1997s. We don't want any videos by the <laughs> back no, then. that's too old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look at their hair. That's what I always hear from students, <laughs> regardless oh, no. if information has changed or not. Um, so let's do 2013. Okay, is that enter. your suggested best practice is about a five to six year window or would you suggest uh, smaller or wider than that or depends on the context? Yeah, exactly. You got it. It depends on the context. Um, is it dealing with a current event or is it more of a guideline policy um, type of thing? So I, I would stick with five years max. Mm -hmm. um, so OK, so let's scroll down and see what we've got. So you can see there we've narrowed it down. So instead of thousands and thousands of results, we're just looking at 18 now. And then so there's your result list there. So building the multicultural team, cross cultural communication. So this is more of what we're looking for. Um, and then you, so you'll see what the source where it's coming from the year. To access the video, all you'll have to do is click on view online. And this is a good example. So this will bring you right into Canopy. Yeah, so Canopy is awesome. It really feels like yeah. uh, that Netflix feel. Um, I think our students probably really like it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So and just as a heads up, tools. we have a new workshop participant joining in. Oh, wonderful. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, I'm just wondering if it's too late. Sorry, my other computer was um, failing when it came to signing in. Like it kept saying, please sign up again. Don't worry about it. Just join in. Like I said, uh, we're recording this, so okay. you can go back and rewatch it again later. Okay, perfect. Absolutely. So similar to Films on Demand here, you'll see the same buttons, um, the share, there's your permanent link there that you'll want to share. Again, don't use that web URL. Um, that permanent link down here will override any login screens um, that you may come across. Yeah, I can um, even see conestogac.canopy.com in the, the share link and the permalink. Yeah, yeah, you got it. So yeah, so that's Canopy for you. Um, again, everything is closed captioned. The nice thing that I like about Canopy is if you come across a film that is not closed captioned, what you'll see right beside it will be a request to closed caption. And that will go directly to the platform. And I find that they are really, really fast with their turnaround time on getting that done because that's they've got a whole team of people ready and willing to transcribe and, and get that accessible. That's fantastic. Um, uh, now, I remember last time we talked about uh, some of the advantages of like if you cr I can see there's a login sign up mm -hmm. um, button on Canopy. What are the advantages to like creating your own account to Canopy and getting logged in or signed up? What can you do with it that you can't do with just sort of like this quick access? Right. So same thing with Films on Demand um, by creating a login. Um, again, it's free to do. You'll you'll be able to save your favorites, create playlists, um, again, create those custom segments. If you don't want, if you, again, if only want 10 seconds of a video, you're able to record that and create it. And then it will create a permanent link again, send it off to your students. Um, and students are able to create these playlists, um, free accounts as well. It's not just limited to faculty and staff. So yes, otherwise you don't necessarily have to create an account to use it. You're free to use it however you please. Nice. nice. So we've kind of covered films on demand and um, and Canopy and there's a lot of similarities to them. I would link to these document or to these videos uh, in my PowerPoints the same way that um, we just talked about, you know, using those PowerPoint slide decks. Uh, 
uh, templates that I had kind of pre-provide. Um, Lacey, I'm going to type it in uh, again, just because you're a little, you're just joining us. Uh, Whitley slash PPT dash this. There we go. Um, feel free to use those templates here and link to it the same way in your Econ is Yoga course shell. Um, but Genevieve, Linda.com is really big and really powerful. Um, and I know a person or two mentioned that they, they're using it or they'd like to use it or they, they're not too sure what it is. Can you take us through Linda.com too? I even saw it on the library homepage. It's like its own button, right? Yeah, that's the, um, the quick link to it is from the library's homepage. Um, so it doesn't matter what way you access it, either if it's from the video portion or straight from the landing page. Um, you can go, oh, sorry, wrong button. You can go straight in, lynda.com. So if you are on campus, um, it may just override the login and you'll be able to access the program. Um, if you're off campus, you're going to want to click on that access link that shows up there. And it you may see that Conestoga login screen. So that's going to be the same way that you log into your email address, the same ID and password. Um, is that what everyone is seeing probably? Yeah, if you see anything different, uh, I'm sure you can troubleshoot your way through it. It's just looking to confirm that you're coming from Conestoga. So in whatever way, just use your Conestoga email um, and that will validate it. Perfect. Yeah. OK, so here's the landing screen for lynda.com. Um, so the thing that I like about Lynda, it's structured in a way that lets you chunk out pieces of a, of a course that you only want to use. Um, so for those who aren't too familiar with Lynda, they are course-based videos that will teach you a concept, um, let's say visual merchandising. So it will take that concept and then break it down into smaller chapters and allow the viewer to watch um, short two minute videos at a time just so that you can convey those concepts um, to the viewer. Um, so you're able to share the whole course or you can share those little snippets. So for example, let I'm just going to click into this one as an example, project management simplified. And I'm going to pop that. Yeah, video doesn't run on video the nicest. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a sample. There's again that familiar play box, uh, closed captioning. What's nice about this is that um, it provides a transcript as well. Um, so you can just you can jump ahead in the video um, by just jumping ahead this way, the typical way to this um, timestamp, or you can jump ahead through the transcript, which is really nice. Yeah, that is really fantastic. Eh? Mm -hmm. um, and those who need it need it a lot. So it is a really helpful thing to kind of have that. I do often find myself like reading along with the video sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you all, you know, you know, when you're watching a movie or a video with uh, the subtitles on, you can't help but read them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I like about uh, lynda.com too is that uh, if you don't mind clicking on it, Genevieve, there's one mm -hmm. item that says exercise files. I'm um, using along the bottom near the transcript. Oh. Yeah. oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these are files. So something to keep in mind about Linda too, just to add to what uh, Genevieve is advocating for here is that lynda.com isn't just a video database. It's a learning sphere. So um, you might find that there's a course on lynda.com on a new software or, you know, here, for example, we're we're talking about project management and it's going to come with templates of files to work on. It's going to come with exercises, questions. Um, it's intended to be a learning resource. Uh, it doesn't cover the gamut. It's, uh, you know, in some of your disciplines or fields, it's not going to get as beautifully in depth as, as your robust industry specific knowledge would, would take students. But what it does a good job of getting some basics covered or reviewing some concepts 
So what um, you could do is look to Linda for content to help students review things from previous semesters. You know, sometimes it's been two semesters since a student has touched on this particular content. Or sometimes there are just gaps that people have, you know, they haven't taken courses in the orders uh, that they might have expected. So lynda.com is a great resource for students in being able to review the essentials or the basics, um, do some practice and some practical exercises with that. It's also really good for us. Um, I learn a lot of software using lynda.com. So uh, that's what it was originally intended for was uh, software knowledge and um, experiences. And they since built out a lot of they have a lot of good STEM resources in here. Um, and they're starting to move more into the, the arts, I think. Does it seem that way to you, Genevieve? Um, a little bit. I feel like they're going more down the business route right now. Um, but yeah, who knows? Who knows where they're going to branch out in the future? Yeah, I'm kind of curious and looking forward to it. Um, but what's nice is that everyone at Conestoga all has access to lynda.com and it's it's bigger than we think it is or bigger than we give it credit for. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I'm just going to point out um, one last thing in Linda um, is that share function that I mentioned. So you there's a link to share the video within your organization. Um, so that's just that portion of that video, that 32 seconds. And I'm looking at 32 based on this um, left hand menu there. So those are the individual chapters versus share the whole course, which is going to open right at the beginning at the welcome. Yeah, so you can kind of choose how big of a, a segment you give to your students. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And again, we see that embed option, um, but the embed option just isn't as beautiful as just simply hyperlink over, hyperlinking <laughs> over to it. Um, it'll work. It'll cooperate better with Econestoga, and it'll work better within your PowerPoints, and your PowerPoints will be smaller for it. Are there any questions about Linda, or anything that you'd like to explore or um, know more about while we're in here? I don't think so. Leanne, you feel it's pretty trial. good with it? I, I can't say I feel good with it, but I now know what it is and what it has. So it's more of a just going in to see if it has the content that I can use. Yeah, Not, hon well, honestly. But, sorry. No, it's OK. I'm done. <laughs> honestly, it's about taking the time to target one database and explore it. Um, maybe ask your, your colleagues what databases do they know of or do they like. They may not be using any, um, but, uh, and Linda is really new to the college. We've only had it for a couple of years. So um, it, I am curious, you know, what resources in there are good? Do you, do you see them as being as all encompassing or are they better for certain contexts? I think we're still exploring that out. Um, but there is time kind of built into this experience right now for you to, you know, you've reserved this two hours to commit to this, this webinar. So let's take some time and just pick one and explore it. And Genevieve and I are here to answer questions, um, to model or demonstrate, to show you examples of how we've seen this used in the class. Um, and that's the intention of, of today's workshop. Are there any other library assets or, or content that you'd like to go back over? Anything that you saw in the library's databases or website that um, you'd be interested in learning more about? I'm interested in the clips like on Canopy because I'm using films from Criterion On Demand, but I'm just wondering if there's a way to do um, the clips from uh, Criterion On Demand as well or only in Canopy. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, Criterion doesn't offer mm -hmm. that because of licensing issues. Um, wow. So you'll note um, certain certain producers such as Fox on Canopy, they only allow for access on campus. Um, that's just the licensing issue that all parties involved in that particular film have agreed upon. Um, so, you know, it is for educational purposes and that's what our license covers um, and that's their way of controlling, you know, view at home versus educational. 
So unfortunately at this time they don't offer that. Um, what mm -hmm. I can recommend though is YouTube in this in this particular instance. They do have um, a channel that's dedicated to major motion pictures and mashups. Um, so if you only require a specific scene to deliver your learning outcome, there's a really good chance that you'll be able to find it there. And that's just YouTube mashup. YouTube oh. mashup, that's the name of the channel or? Yes. Okay. And what are the copyright considerations for using things like mashups or what is anything that we should be aware of or know? You know, like when I think of mashup, I think it's just like short little clips. You got it. Um, so actually I'm gonna head back to the library here. Oh, went too far. Bear with me. Just heading over to the library. Um, okay, so I'm gonna click on videos by type again back to videos and under tips for open access video I pulled a section right out of the copyright act mashups here we go okay so can only be used for non-commercial purposes the original source must be mentioned and again in YouTube um, the poster's handle line will always say where it's coming from. Um, and they have been uploaded legally and majority of the time they are closed captioned, which is a big bonus for us. Um, so no digital locks. So typical things like that. Um, otherwise, yeah, when you are showing just a small mashup, um, it's pretty pretty easy to identify if it's an illegal source. Um, for example, we'll just say, you know, Joanne at home posted this video. So we know that it's not, you know, Marvel or Sony posting it. So we know that that's not an illegal source. Yeah. Awesome. I love that that information is just available like right on the library's web page. Mm -hmm. so you're are you in um the faculty area on the library's web page is that where you went in to get this or how nope. did you get here i just uh went from the videos it's the library and that's uh just that main guide that we've always been in this time so search by type and then into videos and then you'll see the browse collection there so it's, i just scrolled down for to tips for open access videos yeah, that's awesome. I love that that's there already um, so that you kind of have like a self serve option for for getting that. Um, another thing to consider is kind of um, that if if your course has inherited a DVD uh, that they may be using and and the video isn't available on streaming. Genevieve is also your your point person for help with that. Genevieve, mm -hmm. any tips for for courses that may have a DVD in their delivery? Yes, yeah, so um, Streaming is obviously always preferred. Um, again, we do run into licensing issues. Um, there have been some times that I've been able to negotiate with the vendor um, at a fee that the library will pay for to see if we can convert it into a streaming file. Um, so similar to accessible media, it's not that easy to just change format because then we have to um, obtain copyright clearance from the original owner. Um, because we are altering their original work, um, but it is manageable. There has been times where I am able to locate an alternate file format through um, a commercial vendor. So there may be already an existing streaming version. And I just have to purchase it and I would be happy to do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, Genevieve is fantastic, you all. I hope that uh, at least you take away from today that uh, you can connect with Genevieve for all things related to video and video content in your courses. Um, Genevieve, even if you find a YouTube video and you, you love it and it's fantastic, but it doesn't have it doesn't closed have captioning, closed caption. Remember, close, close captioning close is the captioning. absolute bar none, cannot be excluded from our video uh, use in the classroom. It must have closed captioning. But uh, there's been cases where um, a person found a YouTube video that didn't have closed captioning that Genevieve loved, or uh, sorry, Genevieve didn't love it, but uh, <laughs> that they loved. It was the right video for the context. And Genevieve was able to help them get a hold of the person who hosts the video and to either turn on the closed captioning or to get some closed captioning in there to be able to use that in class. 
Um, can we go back to the library homepage to Genevieve? Um, I want to make sure that Thanks. everyone knows that if you scroll down on the library's homepage, um, there's a whole button there that's set up for faculty instruction and curriculum support. So did you know, for example, that in the library, there's a program liaison for your program? There's a person at the library who will help you unearth and dig out resources to use in your teaching. Um, and you can find all the names right here, our program liaison team. Um, you got Chris, Anita, Carrie, and Juliet. Um, and, and you can get a hold of any of those, well, probably the person who's best suited to your program area, but they'll help you find uh, more robust content to add to your course shell. Um, you're not in this alone. You know, our library is full of researchers. Let's use them to their fullest capacity. Um, but you can see in here, you know, there's instructional supports, open access textbooks and OERs. Um, while students are responsible for purchasing the textbook that goes along with your course out, outline, um, there may be ways to supplement your course material uh, using open access textbooks or open education resources. There's so much good stuff out there. Um, there's also copyright guidance, academic integrity supports here, research services, so don't underestimate what's available here in the four faculty area on the library website. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind is that there is bookable tech for you as well. If you're going to do a class delivery and you need like maybe a microphone or a webcam or you need to borrow a laptop for the day, the library has that and that's for you as well. Yeah, look at all that stuff. I love it. And pretty soon there's going to be a couple of uh, cool cameras for people to try out too. Oh yeah, and you can book it all online uh, and in advance, so it's not like you have to wait until the day of. Although the laptops are an exception, they are very popular. Mm -hmm. Yes, the laptops are non-bookable. Um, everything else is bookable and that form goes directly to me. Um, so I would have been in contact uh, with you to confirm uh, when you're able to pick up. Mm -hmm. So kind of between uh, the library's website, the databases that are there, um, I mean, I would I would strongly encourage you to consider the way the library's databases can kind of round out your course content. You know you, it's copyright, you know you're allowed to use it, right? Um, it's quite often a better resource than what you might find on YouTube, and we know all of that content is accessible. So definitely check out what's here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to offer the next, uh, say, 45 minutes to um, do your research. Continue to leave your mic and webcam on if you would like, but Genevieve and I will be here to answer questions, offer support, show guidance, um, anything that might help you use this time productively to get some course materials you could leverage in your teaching this week or next week, whatever, whatever it is that you need from today. Are there any last questions that uh, you'd like to have kind of put out there into the the webosphere before I turn on the recording? Sorry, Leanne. I think I'm OK. You're OK, Aditya, yeah. you too? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we more or less covered it during the mashup discussion, but uh, like if I have to cull out some clips uh, from uh, any commercial Hollywood movies which are like available on YouTube, I know they are not they're not there being put up uh, by legal sources. They're just uploads. So mm -hmm. that is why I have refrained myself from cutting out information. But uh, one of the courses that I teach is uh, organizational leadership. And uh, I couldn't find many case studies, but there are certain, for example, uh, clips in movies which I can use. I have I have thought of those already. So how does that work? And, and I know there would be copyright issues and stuff. So is there a way around it? Because I know some of the library also, I remember if that was Genevieve or someone else, but I was um, in communication with someone regarding the Coach Carter movie, and they were able to provide that for me. That's one of the sources that we use uh, for individual assignments. But otherwise also, the movies that you have on library, uh, the Hollywood flicks, can I just uh, cull out information and clips from them at least? Um, are you referring to the Criterion On Demand database? Uh, 
I don't know what I used, uh, but yes, I was able to stream that movie in class also, and the students were able to access it through library resources. Yeah. I just followed the process which you showed, uh, like play the video from that library catalog. That's what I remember. Okay. Yeah. So for um, for major motion films, um, that would be coming from Criterion On Demand. And um, unfortunately, as, as I was telling Lacey earlier, they don't allow for that custom clip segment. Um, so what I have advised faculty is to note the timestamp on that particular scene and just advise the students and say, OK, jump to um, five minutes and 39 seconds to watch this specific scene. Okay. So that's the best way around that without um, without hitting copyright infringement. Mm -hmm. You can even type that into uh, either onto your PowerPoint slide uh, just above the citation, or you could type it right into the course shell if that's where you're linking to it as well. And then when you're done, if you're playing it in class, then you would just say, OK, I'm going to jump to the timestamp that I've designated. OK. Yeah, so some of them don't let you trim. That's uh, that's just a limitation to uh, to how they can set up shop kind of thing. But um, when they don't let you do that, just work around with it using the timestamps. Um, I that's another reason definitely to avoid those those YouTube videos that we know are are just somebody posting it. You know, yeah. half that's of the time that. it's even just like a video recording of their TV screen. It's yeah, not the even cinema like cinema <laughs> recording. That's what they use the pirated versions and stuff. So so I never yeah. use those things and. Um, yeah, there is some pretty good stuff that Hollywood shows that can be used in leadership and I would have loved to, but I can't. Yeah. I know, I know, it's a fine, fine balance. But you can, like if we have it in our, our streamable databases, you can go ahead and use that. Just, um, yeah, just, just think about how you're going to deliver that in class. Unfortunately, you just work around whatever limitations are set up. OK, perfect. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to turn off the recording. Um, and what I'll do is I'm going to stay online and uh, Genevieve and I will stay online for the next 50 minutes or so to facilitate any questions, um, to help you out in any way and to use this time productively to maybe find some video resources you can use this semester. Um, if 